Hi guys, it's Mr. Y, and today we're going to be talking about population ecology, specifically population growth, and how many different species grow with certain uh, similarities in, in the trends of their growth. Uh, this would also include humans, and how those trends play out and why they play out the way they do. So what does population growth look like for any species under the absolute ideal circumstances, under the best possible conditions? Well, this produces what we call exponential growth. We call it exponential growth in referring to something like from mathematics an exponent, and it produces this curve, which we call the J curve. Looks like a J kind of. Um, this curve means that the growth of the population is more than doubling nearly every time in most cases. It grows up really fast, um, and you see this in many cases where there's absolutely nothing that's limiting the population growth whatsoever. You can see this in some species that are recovering in the wild uh, thanks to conservation efforts and thanks to their own ecosystems recovering. So for instance here we see a nice J curve for elephant populations from about 1900 in which they were vastly overhunted until around 1960 their numbers are relatively low. Then around 1960, something in their ecosystem changed, and we'll actually, I hope, talk about this a bit more, and their numbers began to skyrocket because their ecosystem began to recover. And so it's not something you just see as populations get larger. It also happens as they recover under certain circumstances. Exponential growth, however, is somewhat of a narrow view on how populations grow because it cannot be sustained for a long period of time. Long is a relative word, of course, but it's not sustainable indefinitely. A more realistic population model always ends up limiting growth by incorporating a concept called carrying capacity, and we'll get to this here in a moment. Carrying capacity, when integrated with exponential growth, produces a slightly different curve than what you see with just logistical or exponential growth. It produces a logistical growth curve, which looks more like this, and we call this an S-curve. You can see why it kind of has this sinuous thing to it. Um, exponential growth would predict the population in this case would keep going up and up and up and up and up, and that's just not realistic. Eventually, the ecosystem is going to reach a limit over how many organisms it can support. It reaches this high end and we call this high end the carrying capacity, how many e organisms the ecosystem can support for an indefinite time. And notice time here is a number of generations, not number of years. And so you can see the carrying capacity for this population is about 1,500, about where this line is. And that's where you see the population start to kind of level off. So that's its carrying capacity for that ecosystem for whatever creature this is. Carrying capacity is the maximum number that an ecosystem can support, but the key part is how many individuals it can support indefinitely, so make sure you include that in your definition. It is possible for species in many cases to go beyond carrying capacity in terms of their population size, but they typically can't do it for a very long time. After they exceed carrying capacity, one of three possibilities begins to occur, depending on how high they've gone above the carrying capacity line. So make sure you include this graph, especially you don't have to include the last one. But here's our exponential curve from this point, the J curve. And then here's where we overshot, this is the carrying capacity line. We've overshot carrying capacity in this case, but at this point, one of three things can happen. Either the population can stabilize out, it can crash and if it's too high above carrying capacity it can end up crashing all the way down to where the species is extinct because perhaps there's not enough resources in the ecosystem to support it or in some cases it can actually crash and then cycle back upwards depending on the ecosystem and the interactions with the species you're talking about and the ecosystem so there are three possibilities from this point onwards you can either stabilize the system out crash it to extinction, or possibly begin a cycling path. So here is some real world, real world populations. Uh, this was done in a lab, I grant you, but it's still real data. You can see the population actually goes up, overshoots carrying capacity, and then begins to stabilize with the carrying capacity right about here, maybe about 130, 140. Again, that's not always going to happen, though. Sometimes the curve is actually a much better fit and like barely shoots over carrying capacity, if at all. This is a very nice curve for paramecium. Again, 
you can see the carrying capacity is right about here at about say 900 or so and it fits perfectly within that s curve but then when you look at something like this this is a song sparrow in its natural habitat yeah this thing is fluctuating all over the place if you had to kind of try and estimate a carrying capacity for this you might try your best to do an average and you may say oh its carrying capacity is about 35 but that's really more of a guess this thing is bouncing all over the place due to fluctuations uh, within its environment for either resources or predation and you can see right here it tells you why it says oh there's winter weather that are affecting these things and sometimes the winters will be harder and sometimes they won't be and so the populations will fluctuate a bit more so this thing is actually cycling depending upon its uh, environmental conditions but anything can cause this thing to cycle that limits population growth can make this cycling process happen we see this in many cases um, when it does cycle due to either weather related issues or predation so here is research done on moose in michigan from 1960 to 2003 and in that time you can see it doesn't ever really stabilize it does have this nice j curve but it doesn't ever stabilize it goes up and down and up and down and then there's a severe winter here and everything crashes part of the reason it doesn't stabilize is not just the winter but it's also thanks to predation wolf populations and you would actually see sometimes the predators start to cycle but they're a bit behind the prey so the, if you look at the wolf population it wouldn't be the same numbers but it would cycle too but it would be just a little bit behind the prey because as there's more prey there's uh, going to be more food for the predators and then the predator number increases and when there's less prey there's less food for the predators and some of them begin to starve so it begins a predator prey cycling process so what actually limits how big your carrying capacity can be. There's a number of things that can limit it. And again, you can think of this in terms of the food chain. It could be limits from below you on the food chain or above you on the food chain, or it could also be on the food web to the side of you. It could be competition. So food, water, space, territory, predation, that's above you, uh, diseases, abundance of mates, weather cycles, natural disasters, all these can limit how big your carrying capacity can be. Also, how fast you reproduce, how much parental care there is for offspring. If you, know, if you have uh, things like elephants, they have long-term parental care. Their parental care can last 30 years before their children are actually ready to reproduce. Same thing in the case of whales, it takes years. Whereas if you're talking about mice, mice can be ready to reproduce in under 30 days in many cases. So all this can affect how big carrying capacity in an ecosystem can be, and it's different for each species. The thing is, some populations are going to have it worse. And what I mean by that is that populations where there's more individuals that are denser tend to have other limits that you don't think about. Disease, for one, tends to spread more easily when you have dense populations. There's less space. That should make sense to you. So this is what we call a density-dependent limit. Um, there's also more intense competition with fewer resources. You see this in populations where there's high density as well because there's more individuals, there's more competition for those resources. There's also the issue of more waste to avoid or deal with somehow. Toxins build up. All of this stuff becomes an issue when you have dense populations. So these are all density dependent factors. Things that are not density dependent factors, natural uh, disasters, things like that, where the population size plays no role over whether it has an impact or not. But there are populations that have limits thanks to the fact that they are so dense with the number of individuals. And if it hasn't hit you yet, then you should be thinking, oh yes, this makes sense in terms of humans as well. If you think about places that are really expensive to live, big cities, big metropolitan areas, part of the reason is, well, prices are so intense or much higher than what you find in rural areas because there's more competition for those places. You have to deal with higher taxes typically because you have to deal with all the extra fees of getting rid of stuff like waste products, your trash, and things like that. Disease tends to spread more easily where human populations are dense as well. So metropolitan areas tend to be epicenters for things to, like the flu virus to spread. And so we have actually seen this in some basic surveys from uh, history over the human population. We've seen the J-curve go up, and we've seen places where density-dependent factors have played in, like the bubonic plague. And while this graph is nice, it's not really an accurate graph. I mean, it's maybe accurate from about 1900 on, but this is really a Eurocentric viewpoint. We really don't have good estimates of the human population population. Um, 
for instance, of Americas prior to European um, colonization, because nobody's really sure how many uh, Native Americans were there prior to that. Some say as few as 2 million, some say as many as 20 million. Same thing with Africa. We really don't know what the population of Africa is to any great extent beyond the 16, 1700s when Europeans started trying to colonize it. So this graph is nice, but it is um, a Eurocentric viewpoint. It's based upon numbers out of Europe in many cases, and it does show the pattern. Just keep in mind, it's not necessarily 100% accurate. We do know uh, pretty good data from about uh, post-colonization onwards. So this graph is much more accurate, it goes from about 1750 to, well, it actually has projections out to 2150. And you can see here where we're expected to see the highest amount of population growth is actually in countries that are less economically developed. This is because uh, these are typically rural areas where you're talking about subsistence living, subsistence farming. Farmers tend to have more children to help with manual labor, whereas in developed country, there's higher levels of education. There's things that are easily accessible like birth control. There's better medical, um, medical technology, so you have a better chance of surviving. And so we're actually expected over the next 100 years or so to see a greater amount of population growth from less developed countries that don't have access to these things. And so in other words, economics plays a huge role in human population growth. Economics helps define what limits population growth and what doesn't. So this is a nice chart. I don't want you guys to copy down this chart, so don't worry about it. Just make sure you take a good long look at it as I work through some of the key parts of it, but there's other things I won't touch on that. You guys can read on your own. This is a demographic transition for different areas of the world. Usually it's based upon countries, and it shows you very nicely how the total population of that specific area grows. Again, you can see this nice J curve, which eventually starts to reach a carrying capacity based upon certain limits. Um, so you see the J curve morphs into the S curve. But what you can see is that we have this organized into one, two, three, four, five different states um, based upon where that growth is. So different countries are placed into different areas based upon how the population is growing and their death rates, let me do this in black, and their birth rates here. And this is an older graph uh, in terms of the information on there. So someplace like Japan, Japan is actually no longer in station four, it's over here in station five. Uh, France too is no longer here, it's over here probably, and many other places in Europe. Uh, I think Brazil is starting to move over to station four last I checked, and I'm pretty sure India and um, uh, uh, India has moved over here to station three. But the idea is that initially populations tend to be low because there's not much access to medical technology and you're also talking about areas where there's lots of farming. And so many children die at an early age. There's not a lot of access to medical technology. But as the access to that technology begins, um, death rate decreases. You can see the death rate here drops and therefore several, um, populations increase because more people are surviving. Notice the birth rate actually stays stable for a bit. It might fluctuate, but it stays stable. So this causes the population to start to spike up to begin exponential growth. Then as the death rate begins to drop to a stabilizing point, this is you know, where you hit the limits of technology, the birth rate too will start to decline as people realize, oh, you don't need to have uh, 10 kids because you're not living a subsistence life on a farm. And so improvements in medical care, diet, education, all that stuff leads this population to not just increase, but then to start to slow down to reach the capacity for that area. And that is about where the U.S. is. We are slowing down. We're still increasing, but we're slowing down. And again, some more advanced um, economic areas are actually in decline. Japan is in decline in many areas in Europe where they actually have more people dying than they do being born. And again, this is usually based upon economic factors, but there's other factors as well, not just economics. There's social factors and things like that. And just take a good long look at this graph, make sure things make sense. Again, don't have to copy it, just make sure you understand what it's showing you in terms of these five states. So just how many humans can the Earth actually support? What is the carrying capacity of the overall Earth? 
Well, currently, and this is current as of the time I'm speaking, it's probably changed when you guys are watching this, the Earth is at 7.7 .7 billion people. It's actually probably more like 7.8 right now, with an estimated U.S. population around 730 million people. The carrying capacity is really unclear because there's a lot of factors that go into it. Technology in areas like um, advances in areas like farming, how much different peoples of the world consumes makes everything a very hard calculation, and so estimates can vary wildly. Some estimates I've seen say that if everybody lives in terms of consumption like uh, a citizen of the U.S., well then that means you're going to need a lot of resources to make everybody live, so the carrying capacity is only going to be maybe two billion people. Obviously we're already over that. Um, some estimates I've seen where they say, well, if everybody is a minimalist consumer that is doesn't consume any more than is essential, basic, you know, not, not starving yourself or anything like that, but basic needs taken care of, the carrying capacity could possibly be as high as 40 billion. We are really not sure. We do know that the estimates uh, vary wildly and that currently the projections are that the human population is gonna level out somewhere around 10 to 11 billion currently, maybe as high as 12, but we are not sure in reality. Those are just projections. So there's two articles I would strongly advise you just to take a look at. Uh, they talk about that projection of the world population and where they've uploaded um, different projections for different countries as well. And you can see different continents, different countries have different projections for how fast their populations are gonna grow. And again, a lot of things play into this. Economics, um, cultural differences, things of that nature, they can all play into this. So take a look at those articles. Just make sure you understand the concept of carrying capacity and what limits carrying capacity and make sure that makes sense in terms of how I've explained it. If you have any questions, do make sure you ask me when you come back to class.